2024. Also, um, just didn't add this to the announcements. Um, remember, we're going to be having a pretty much a leadership workshop um, in the month of June. And we're doing this in collaboration with the Spanish church. So like Friday night, I think it's the 25th, um, the Friday night will be a, a woman's uh, revival. Saturday night will be a, a men's revival. They're going to be doing those in Spanish. And then um, Sunday morning, we'll have the preacher preaching for us. But Saturday morning um, from about uh, 8.30 to 11, and then from... 12 to about 2, we're going to be having workshops, um, and this is going to be open to the Spanish church as well, but these are the topics um, after, you know, just some prayer and some communication with the pastor. We're going to be talking about uh, managed conflict, uh, and this is all ministry-based, uh, understanding the change, and the third one is unique. Uh, the third one is called lie, parentheses, life and ministry. Um, I'll let you hang on to that one because that, that's, that's a unique one. Um, and I'm excited. So um, I'm excited about this. We have already, uh, we've done what we've had to do. The tickets are bought. Um, he, the brother's coming with his wife. His wife is going to help minister as well. Um, I uh, talked to them this week and I let his wife know that, hey, I would really love for her um, to have a part um, and also come from a female's perspective or a woman's perspective in ministry and, and, and allow God to kind of uh, use her because I think it's, it's very important. And matter of fact, if you look in this church right now, uh, the men are outnumbered, right? Um, and, and can I tell you this? It, this is not unusual. It, whether you're a small church or a big church, there's usually more women in the church than there are males, yet... Church in the year 2023 is dominated by male figures. And I think that it's, it's important that we understand that God called all of us, not just men. God can use men and women, right? He can use children and, and teenagers. So it, there's a reason why it says that I will pour out my flesh upon all men, right? And all children. It, it's, it's not just saying that uh, the woman comes to church and sits down and, and does kitchen duties. That's not what it's saying. Amen. God can use every single one of you. And, and let me tell you, um, even now in the year 2023, you will come across pastors that will not allow a woman to step on the pulpit. You will find a pastor that will not allow a woman to give a class. Um, you, will, you will see a pastor that won't allow uh, women to teach men, but only children. Amen. So I, I'm not saying this to bash those pastors, but I, what I am saying is, is that we're lacking a resource in the church. Okay. And, and we need to be inclusive in all of those areas. So let's go to the book of Genesis um, chapter 24. Today I'm going to be speaking under the, the message, uh, the model of a servant. And um, I'm going to be reading pretty much uh, verse 1 through 9, but I'm going to be maybe jumping around. And I'm going to give you some context, and I'm going to give you something to think about. I'm also going to give you some references upon how uh, the representation of Abraham and, and Isaac and how they represent different things in the Old Testament. But most of all, um, what I'm hoping you get out of today's uh, sermon is to understand what it means to be a servant, to understand the responsibility of being a servant and knowing when you need to serve. Amen? Because there's a difference. Right. There's a difference. And we'll we'll see that. So let's read. Let's send to our feet. Uh, verse one through verse nine in the book of Genesis. Amen. In the book of Genesis. And the word of the Lord says as follows. And it says, now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age. And and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, I want you to just remember this. Notice that here. That there's no name for the servant. It just identifies him as the oldest servant. Amen? 
over his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to the country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who has took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying to, you, to your descendants, I give this land, he will send his angels before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Amen. You may take your seats. It's, um, it's interesting because there's some customs here that seem kind of weird, right? Like if I was to come up to one of you and be like, hey, put your hand underneath my thigh and swear to me, you might look at me a little bit funny, right? Is that a fair statement? Um, but you got to look at it that in those times, putting your hand underneath somebody's thigh was a very intimate and, and, and a very um, honorable thing to do uh, when you are making a promise or a covenant with somebody. Um, it's like, um, I've, I was told this, right? It says there's, there, there's nothing like a handshake and a man's word. Have you guys ever heard that before, right? But now some people will say, man, what happened to a man's word and just shaking on it, right? Well, in those days, putting, putting your hand under somebody's thigh was similar to, to what we would call a handshake and somebody giving you their word that they will follow through with what you promised, right? It, it was essentially establishing a contract or a covenant or a pact saying, what I said I was going to do, I will fulfill, and I will not let you down, right? So that's why the servant said, he said, but Abraham, you're, you're telling me not to, let you, not to let your son marry a Canaanite woman, right? Uh, and you're telling me to go get him a wife, but what if the wife or the woman doesn't want to come? Now, now the ladies here in the church, let's be honest, if, 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 I, if you were all single and, and, and the Lord spoke to me and said, go get uh, X, Y, Z, a, a husband, and I go and I bring you that husband and say, hey, this is who you got to marry. How many of you in today's time will say, okay, pastor, I'm going to marry him? Probably none, right? Well, in those days, it was a custom that... that, that that the woman would be married, married off, right? And not only would she be married off, but there's usually a contract to where uh, there had to be an agreement amongst the parents, and there would be an exchange. Usually the exchange was something of value, cattle, uh, uh, clothing, silver, gold, uh, land, um, all of these things. And if you notice when the servant, if you read the story, the servant doesn't just go by himself. The servant takes cattle, and he takes gold, and he takes silver, and he takes uh, um, uh, jewelry, and he takes uh, uh, robes and investments to put on. Because you're going to notice later on in the story, um, it, when you read it, is that she gets dressed. She decides, I'm going to go. And it says that he dresses her in a certain manner to identify as a woman that has decided and decided to be betrothed to a man. Now, you may say, Pastor, why are you giving me all this information? Because I'm trying to give you some context uh, of understanding um, all that the servant is doing, right? So, but before I get to the seven things, I'm going to talk about the seven things that a servant does. I, I want to give you some, some context, too. Okay, so here, uh, it, it's, it, it, Abraham is a symbolism almost of a king. Okay, it shows a, a symbolism of a king and 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 he has servants that he sends out. Right. And the servant who he sends out is a representation of the spirit. Okay. And and here, Isaac is a representation of the bridegroom. OK, 
Okay? Does that sound familiar so far? So you have the king, right, who's sending out his servant, his spirit, and, 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 and he is going to go get the bride. And who is the bride? Is that here is a representation of the church. So you have the king who sends out his servant, the Holy Spirit, to prepare the bride for his bridegroom, who is a representation of Jesus. Okay, and, and it's very important that we understand that because throughout the Bible, you see a lot of symbolism, but I am a firm believer of this. If you can read the book of Genesis, and you heard me say this before, if you read all of the book of Genesis and all of the book of, uh, of Revelation, you will understand what the Bible says because everything that you need to know are in those two books. Everything in the middle is pretty much just filling in information. Okay, it's giving you it's giving you some information. So what are what what are the, the what is the model of a servant? So there are seven points that I want to make today. Seven points. Because in verse 66 it says, it says, and the servant told Isaac all the things that had that he had done. This is important. Um, the servant here now comes and he gives a testimony of what he went through. And, and this is funny to me, and I don't say funny like ha-ha, but more like funny like ironic, right? Like, like I'm, I'm looking at this and I think about how many times has the Holy Spirit worked in our life and we stay quiet about it and we don't testify about all that has happened because God has blessed it, God has ordained it, God has anointed it, but yet we stay quiet. Is that a fair statement? Right. So so we need to be vocal. We need to be just like the servant. And, and we need to understand that when 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 God uh, sends you out and he fulfilled what he has told you to do, we should be testifying of how God backed you up every step of the way. But often we often testify about what went wrong, but we fail to testify about what went right. You see, it's easy to tell people about your valley moments, but, but a true servant will, will, will say, uh, listen, I, yeah, I, I had valley moments, but let, let me tell you about the victories. Let's focus on the victory that God has given us or given me. So that's very important. Because a true servant, or when you're in the model of a servant, the servant will focus on what God did, not what he went through. I'll say that again, because you missed it. A servant will focus on what God has done, not on what he went through. A servant doesn't make it about him. He makes it about his master. Amen. He makes it about the Lord. And that's very important when we're serving God is that we need to get out of the way. See, the servant just asks for clarity of the instructions. And he got out of the way. He said, okay, so you want me to go get him a wife? I just have a question. What if she doesn't want to come? And Abraham said, well, that's easy. If she doesn't want to come, then you are free from this pact that we're making. Because you have followed through with what I'm asking you to do. Now, how many times has God told us to do something and something doesn't happen and we dwell on it? God tells you, listen, once I tell you to do something, if, it, if, 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 if the person or the thing or the place doesn't re respond to the instructions that I am giving, you're free. So don't, 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 don't get stuck to something that's holding you back because God is saying, as a servant, I told you to go do, and you did it. Now, if that thing doesn't respond, that's not your responsibility no more. That's important. Because as a servant, a lot of times we get stuck on what, what didn't happen, and we forget about what did happen. In, in other words, God told you to do and you were obedient to do. It's not up to you to change the response of the person, place, or thing. Right. It was just up to you to go do what God told you to do. But a lot of times we get stuck. 
But let's follow some of the instructions. Don't allow my son to get married to the women of the land where I live, the Canaanites. Um, don't take them with you to back to my father's house and uh, bring him back a wife. And lastly was, if that woman you find doesn't want to come, you're free of everything I told you to do. Very simple, right? So, so when God tells you to do something, just follow the instructions. Don't, don't add to it. Don't, don't, don't assume. Don't, don't take away. Just, yeah, if he gives you four steps, don't do five. If he gives you three, don't do two. Just, just go through the steps. If he says do one, two, three, four, then do one, two, three, four. If he tells you do A, C, and E, don't do A, B, C. Because in our mind, you're like, Pastor, you just skipped the letter. I know, but that's the way God told me to do it. Because God's process and God's logic fits outside of our ability to comprehend the overall purpose of what he has for us. But we can ask questions as the servant did. The servant asked a question. So my first point here, and you can find this through verse 2 through 9 in this chapter, my first point is, is that the servant does not run unsent. The servant does not run unsent. What does that mean? He does not go unless he was sent. That's point number one. Self-sent. Self-sent usually goes to self-centered. When you self-sent, you're focused on what you can do versus giving God glory through what he wants you to do. So point number one is that a servant never sends himself or herself, right? A servant never sends themselves. They always wait for God to send them with instructions. When God sent Abraham to sacrifice his son, he gave him instructions. Abraham, I need you to go and sacrifice your son. Abraham got his son. He went walking. His son started asking questions like, hey, God, I mean, hey, hey, Dad, well, uh, we, have, um, we have the wood. We got fire. Where's the sacrifice? Notice Abraham didn't say, hey, son, you're it. He said, the Lord will provide. Do you see where I'm going with this? Right? Abraham just followed the instructions because he was a servant. He served God 100%. There was no teeter-tottering. And he did exactly what God told him to do. Well, where, where am I going? I'm going to show you. Well, well, God, where are you taking me? Just walk. Okay, I'm going to walk. You're going to show me. And all of a sudden, okay, here it is. <gasps> okay, I'm, I'm where God wants me to be. Okay, God, what's next? He's going to be prepared as an altar. Isn't it interesting, though, that you don't really see in Scripture where Abraham told his wife? I'll give you another one. It also doesn't tell you that his son Isaac resisted him when he put him on the altar. Have you ever thought about that? Because I'm pretty sure that in today's time, you told a mama, hey, God said to sacrifice our boy. There's no way you're going to get that boy away from mama. It's not going to happen. Right? So that's interesting to me that it doesn't identify that. And, and I'm going to tell you what I get from this is that when God sends you, you don't need to get the approval of those around you because you know God sent you through his Holy Spirit. But often God sends us and we speak what God has told us, which makes you look or makes even me look. If I was to tell you everything God has told me, y'all would think I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You would think I'm crazy. But there's some things that God will tell you, just like he's told me, that it's nobody else's business. It's between you and God. 
Notice here the servant, he went and got what he needed. Now, don't misunderstand me. You need to go get the tools and the, and the, and the things or even the persons that, that are, are part of the process to, for you to fulfill your mission. But there are certain things that it's nobody's business when God sends you. You do not see the servant explaining to everybody else what he was sent to do. He just simply did. That's, that's important. There's a reason why the Bible says don't let the left hand know what your right hand is doing. Okay? A lot of people just associate that with giving, but in actuality, there are some things that God has told you in intimacy that it's nobody else's business. I want you to think about that word, in to me see. It's, there's an in to me. God, when you have intimacy with God, he is pouring into you things that are intimate that is nobody else's business. And unless God has told you to share it, you're violating that intimacy. You don't invite strangers into the bedroom when you're being intimate with your loved one. Because it's between you and that person. The same applies with God. When God is being in to me. When God is pouring in to you, it's between you and God. Unless God tells you to share it. So my first point is, a servant doesn't just go and he doesn't share what he wasn't told to share. You know, when people say, well, Pastor, why, well, why can't I just be excited about what God told me to do? Because it's not about you. That's why. It's about God. At the end of the day, he told you to do something because he trusts, you, he trusts you so much and he believes that you will fulfill what he has told you. So now all you have to do is run to what he told you. And when a servant makes it about God and he does it according to what God has told him to do, God always glorifies himself. God's favor and God's grace will follow them and accompany them as they go in and out of the process. God will provide what you need. I'm going to tell you, it's interesting because, and, and it'll be one of my points a little bit further, but it's interesting because the servant gets told by the master what to do. He prepares himself to do what he was told to do, but he prays before he does it. He prays before he does it. In other words, he knows, it's not that he's doubting what he was told to do by the master. But what he's saying is, I'm going to pray that what the master told me to do, I found favor and I find grace along the way so that any obstacles, he gives me wisdom and he gives me guidance to fulfill what he has called me to do. And this is how you know the difference. See, when you are sent by God, you rely on him. But when you are self-sent, you are troubled because you're not hearing from God. It's important. Pastor, are you saying I'm not hearing from God? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm giving you a key. I'm giving you a key of understanding that when God sends you, he prepares the road before you. You don't have to be a trailblazer when God is already blazing the trail before you. God goes before you. He doesn't go behind you. So God is your trailblazer. God is the one that's going to make a way out of no way. God is the one that's going to make a possible out of an impossible situation because if he sent you, 
He'll orchestrate the path that you need to take. That's very important. Point number two is found in verse 4 and in verse 10. He goes where he's sent. He doesn't go outside. He doesn't take a detour. So point number one is he doesn't go unsent. Point number two is he goes where he is sent. And, it, and I want you to understand this. He doesn't add to or take away. He goes directly to where he needs to go. He asked God for directions. He didn't ask somebody else for directions. That's important. Sister Carolyn, can you give me your mic? So it's very, very, very important that we understand and we follow through with when God wants to send you. So let's understand that God doesn't just want you to do things because you feel it. God wants you to do things because he told you to do it. And then not only does he tell you to do it, he wants you to be specific and on purpose. He wants you to do what he's told you to do. He wants you to stay in that purpose, and he doesn't want you to detour. So my second point is, is that you go exactly and you do exactly what God instructed you to do. Don't deviate or take a detour. You may think that those obstacles are hindering you. But those obstacles are there to glorify God in the midst of your journey. I'll give you an example. David had to fight Goliath. That's a pretty big obstacle considering that it is estimated that he was between 13 and 15 feet. Think about that. If we think seven feet is tall, add another five, six feet to it. And here is an obstacle. An undefeated giant, two, two or three times taller than I am. And all I have is five smooth stones, a, pa a shepherd's bag, and a slingshot. Can I ask a question, and you guys answer this honestly? Have you ever questioned God, or maybe not questioned, just ask God a question, let's put it that way better, right? Ask God a question because he told you to do something, but the giant that's standing in front of you can be a little bit intimidating? I have. Is that a fair statement, right? But God is saying, don't look at the size of the giant. Look at the size of my purpose. It, it, it's a saying, right? This is a, a pretty much a cliche. It says, don't tell God about the size of your mountain. Tell your mountain about the size of your God. So here's David. He was sent. He was sent by his father to check. But look at, look at how this, look, look at how God's purpose unfolds. And you may not understand this because everybody was like, oh, David, was, I've heard this before. David was a tattletale. That's why his brothers didn't like him because he was always checking up on his brothers. If you notice, you know, in the Bible, a lot of men got in trouble because their father sent them out. Joseph got sent to check up on his brothers, gets thrown in a pit. David gets sent to his brothers and ends up in a fight with a giant. You see, sometimes God sends you to a place or to a person to a thing and there's more to it than what you think it is you see sometimes God can send you to a person and you think that you're going to that person just to pray for healing when you end up delivering sometimes you God will send you to a person you think you got to deliver and what they need is healing but the key is is that you want 
And when you go, God will give you the understanding of what you're supposed to do because when you are sent at his servant, he will not only tell you what to do, he will give you the resources to do it. I believe that in the church, part of the problem of why we don't see some deliverance, and I'm talking about the church worldwide, is because we often say that we were sent when we weren't sent. Because when God sends you, there's God manifesting power that shows up with it. You don't believe me? Well, let's talk about the disciples. Let's talk about Paul, right? You have these men that are trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And the Jesus is like, and, and, and the demons are like, I know who Jesus is, but who are you? Because they were like, in the name of the God of, uh, of Peter, uh, of Sister Carolyn, Sister Leslie and Scott, uh, and not God. And the demons are like, I know them, but who are you? See, they were sent. That's why the demons knew who they were. You see, when, when God sends you, the marking that's on you will identify who you are. Therefore, you become a representation of the king. And if you are a representation of the king as a sent servant, then you walk in that authority because your father sent you. Don't go somewhere with unauthorized access. Go there because God has given you access. And that's what the servant is doing. Point number three. I already ta talked on it. He does nothing else. He stays on track. Notice that when God told Joshua, he said, I need you to walk around Jericho. And I just need you to be quiet while you do it. That's all they had to do, Sister Karen. Every day, walk around Jericho one time. There was just one instruction. There, there was another instruction part of that, right? Is what? And they had to be what? Quiet. See, sometimes God tells you, just do this, be quiet, just do it. Don't, don't just quiet. You'll understand later. Right? But often, we want to talk when we need to be listened. See, servants listen. Servants take time to understand what's being asked versus giving a rebuttal, a rebuttal of why it can't be done. You see, in the human mind, walking around, the, the, walking around Jericho in silence was never going to knock the walls down. It wasn't. I, I can see somebody telling me, well, pastor, that's not going to work. We got to be more active. We got to do this and we got to do that. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is what God told you to do, whether you understand it or don't understand it. So if God says walk around one time, the next day he says do it again, right? I can just picture a, 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 a member of the church being like, Pastor's crazy. He's making us walk around, and we just wasting time. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're so dis disappointed. It's funny. I'm, I'm going to use my job as an example. Uh, um, I, I had to prepare a training on how to properly um, report incidences, accidents and, accidents and stuff like that. And there's a guy that he, he wrote me privately and said, I just want you to know that what you're asking me to do is just busy work. Why don't you worry about fixing other things that need fixing? And he gave me a list of what he thinks needs to be done before anything else. Sister Leslie, temperature got a little hot in my ears, right? A little hot. So I just took the time and I kept reading it and I, and I called uh, another counterpart and he explained to me about that person and what they've been going through. And it made me think. And I simply said this. I said, 
I'm new to the company, and I appreciate you telling me your concerns. I said, but this training that I'm doing, you're judging out of a handout. You haven't even sat through the class so that you can see that some of the things that you are pointing out, I'm addressing in the training. You see, sometimes we judge by what we perceive or what we see because we have yet been revealed the innermost parts of what needs to happen to get to that final outcome. You see, people can easily say, can you imagine the people of Jericho be like, look at these crazy Israelites. They're just walking around. They're, psh, they don't scare me. They're up on the, they're up on the outlook post, and they're like, ha, ha, look at them. For the last six days, they've been walking around. And then on the seventh day, they had to walk around seven times, but the instructions changed. See, they were sent out as servants to just be obedient. And on the last, on the last time that they went around for that seventh time, God told them, I want you to shout, blow your trumpets. And it says that the walls fell flat. They didn't crumble. They just fell flat. Now, you see, what they didn't understand is that having millions of people walk around a foundation of walls, the weight and the constant shaking of that ground will loosen some things that are unseen. So the enemy's like, they can't get to me. But what they don't realize is that God is just preparing the soil for the collapse of the enemy so that you can now go into his territory and take over. Do, do you understand? Do, are you following me? Are you picking up what I'm dropping? So sometimes God will tell you, I need you to work in silence because that's how you're going to confuse the enemy. The enemy is going to be like, I see what she's doing. I see what he's doing. And he thinks that's going to work. What he doesn't realize is, is that you're just setting up the foundation of what God is getting ready to do through you. Because you walked in obedience and your walk in obedience causes things to fall flat. So just imagine if God told us, just walk around this community. Don't say hi to nobody. Don't, don't go to their house. Just walk. Just walk. And when you least expect it, that walk has loosened something in the spiritual atmosphere where people are going to start getting freed and they're going to be loose from some chain. They're going to be loose from addiction. They're going to be loose from curses. They're going to be loose. Because sometimes all we have to do is walk in silence. You don't believe me? It says that people were being healed in the New Testament. People were being healed just because but Peter wasn't doing anything. He was just walking. And you know what the Bible says? That his shadow, his shadow will touch people and they were delivered and healed. And all he was doing was walking. That's the type of anointing that I desire in my life, that I don't have to speak for God. I just walk in what God tells me to do, and people get delivered. But we need to learn the model of a servant. So, so my first point was he doesn't run unsent. The second point is he goes where he's sent to. The third point is he does nothing else but what he was instructed. And look at what point number four. He's prayerful and thankful. And you can see this. In verses 12 through 14 and 26 through 27. Every time God showed up or God answered a portion of what he was asking God to do his, on his behalf in his journey, he gave him thanks. Every step of the way. Every step of the way, he just said, God, I thank you. Because there's a part where he actually said, he said, he stopped at a well. And he's like, God, let a woman show up. Let her give me something to drink when I ask her. Doesn't that sound familiar? Showing up at a well, 
asking a woman to drink, right? I'm just saying, there's a story that matches Jesus' story. And, and he says that, it's this, so think about it. Just think about it. So this woman, right, she comes with this, this bucket like a boom box, and she's showing up, so it says on her shoulder. And he's like, hey, can you give me something to drink? And it says that she was at haste. She, she, she hurried and got him something to drink and said, listen, not only am I going to give you something to drink, I'm going to give your camel something to drink. And he gave God thanks. He's like, God, thank you, because this is the woman. This is the woman. You see, when God sends you along the way, he confirms that you're on the right track. Along the way, he will put things to just remind you you're on the right track. I remember I did the big mud run in Savannah, Georgia, five, five miles, 30 obstacles, and about two and a half miles in, and I was a lot heavier than I am now. And I was training for a little bit over three months. And when I got halfway, Brother Scott, halfway, I thought I was going to die. And this has happened to me in two different parts of my life. One was on something that I signed up for. Two was when I was being disobedient and God said, let me get you back on track. In this situation, I'm tired. I'm with my trainer and I'm walking and I look at a sign and it says, don't be weary. God is with you. And then a couple of steps further, there was another, you could do all things in Christ who strengthens. I mean, it was just, I was like, okay, I got you, God. You're with me. And I finished. The second time this happened was I wanted to go see a waterfall in, 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 in the jungles of, of Honduras. And I, I went to see the waterfall, but instead of going back the way that I came, I said, wait a minute, the meter markers are going down, so we must be closer. And I ended up going across three different mountaintops, and the sun was setting down. And there was at one point where I, there's jaguars up there, and I said, I said God, you got to help me because I'm a, I'm a good meal for a jaguar. So I started looking for, I even made a video, I still have it. I even made a video just in case. And you know what I was thinking? On the next Oprah Winfrey, pastor gets lost in the jungles of Honduras, right? Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm talking and on a tree, on a tree that I happen to put my hand to rest on, it is carved in there. It says, uh, do not be weary for I am with you. I made it out at like 8.30 at night. And if you want to see evidence of that picture, I have, I have quite a few. Because I went in when the sun was going up, and I got out when the sun was going to be down. You see, when God is with you, even when you take a detour as a servant, he will do everything to remind you, I'm going to get you back on track. But it's so much easier to stay where he tells you. That's why I'm telling you that as a servant, don't get off track. If he tells you don't go to the right, just go straight. Don't go to the left, just go straight. Well, guess what? Don't go right and don't go left, just go straight. Because that's what a servant does. And then when God co continually reminds you that he's with you, give him thanks and praise and pray to him. I thank you and I glorify you because you're with me. I'm not alone. Have you ever felt alone when God has told you to do something? God is with us, guys. So number one, don't go unless you're sent. Go when you're sent is number two. Don't do nothing else but do what he told you to do. Be pr number four, be prayer prayerful. This number five is found in verse 17 through 18 and verse 41. He's wise when he wins. What does that mean? He gives God thanks. He gives God thanks. Verse 17 and 18. He says, and the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, drink, my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. He stayed humble 
even when he recognized that God over, over, he answered his prayer. That's what it means by be wise. Don't boast, because guess what? You're only part of the victory. You're part of it. You're not the reason for it. Just to, I'll say that again. You were part of the victory, but you're not the reason for the victory. The victory came because of God, not because of you. You were just a tool. I, I look at it this way. When, when your car breaks down, the mechanic uses a tool or tools to fix your car. It wasn't the tool that fixed it. It was the mechanic who was using the tool that knew how to use the tool. See, God knew how to use you to glorify him to fulfill his purpose. So you've got to allow yourself to become a tool in God's hands as a servant. Can I tell you something? You don't get to choose what tool you become. Sometimes you just might be used as a doorstop. See, Pete, a doorstop is a tool. See, the doorstop is very important. It's a very, very, um, it can be a very um, not glorious tool, right? Because doorstops usually get kicked in, get smashed in between something, right? And it's holding the pressure of the door. So what you don't realize is that to you, a doorstop might just be a useless tool, but it's always constantly under pressure. So the reason that you might be a doorstop is because God has built you to withstand pressure that holds the door open for those that need access to God. So you're complaining about being a doorstop, and you're wondering why they can't be a doorstop, and God says, because they're not made under the same pressure that you were made. And because you were made this way and you were built this way, I need you to stop some things from closing in people's faces so that they still have access to me. And that's just a doorstop. Number six. Very important. I would say this is probably the most important. Number six, speaks not of himself, but of his master's and his master's riches. When you are sent, you are not to speak of you. You are to speak of your master. We often get hung up in relating to people. But the most, reliable, the most relatable person in history is Jesus because he suffered all things, endured all things. He took chastisement upon himself for you and for me. Think about that. And we often try to understand others by putting it in context and through what our experiences are. When the Bible tells you that his thoughts and his ways are not our thoughts and our ways. So maybe you think that this is what it's supposed to be and God's saying, listen, don't be quick to judge. Don't be quick to analyze. Don't be quick to dissect. Because what you think might not be what I'm trying to accomplish. I don't know about you, but there's been times where I have overanalyzed, where I have assumed, where I have thought that I knew that I knew that I knew that God was going to do X, Y, and Z, and he ended up doing ABC. Because I was putting God in a box that I can control and understand. And God is not worthy of a box like that. Or let me change that around. The box is not worthy of God. Because what I'm trying to say here is, is that the box cannot contain or comprehend what God and his full essence is. 
But here we are in church, we want to be servants, but we want to serve according to what we can fit in the box. And when God tells you to serve outside of the box, your world falls apart because it's outside of your comprehension and understanding. And God says, I don't need you to understand or comprehend. I need you to be obedient and follow me according to my word because my word will guide you to all truth. Number seven. Number seven. I need you to put a little star next to it because I believe this is the one thing that as servants we forget to do. So to me, the most important part is what? Recognizing God, right, in all of it. But number seven, we need to put a little star next to it, a little asterisk, because number seven is something we forget to do. Number seven, presents the true issue and requires clear decisions. When God calls you to serve and you are obedient and you run and you stay on task and you're thankful and you're wise in your victory, you make sure that you always, always, always deal with the issue and make precise decisions according to God's guidance. We can't allow the enemy to flood us with different perspectives all the time because with each perspective there's a new issue that comes that distracts you from the main issue. Have you ever had that before? If you've ever been a leader in any organization, whether it's church or whether it's secular, and you're a leader or a manager, people will often tell you a hundred issues but fail to focus on the reason why that w the, those hundred issues exist. And usually if you can take care of that one issue, those other hundred will dissipate, will go away. Right? It's like... A lot of people be like, oh, look, there's, there's weeds in my grass, right? And, and, oh, pastor, what we need to do is cut it. Well, it grows back. Oh, pastor, what we need to do is just, just, you know, put a little bit of vinegar with baking soda and, and, and throw it down. And it, No. You see, there are some things that you can't just cut out of your life. There are some things that you got to go straight to the root cause. You got to go to the root. Because as long as the root's there, it still has an opportunity to grow back. And usually when it grows back, it grows back more fierce. So I need to understand that when you are sent by God, just like the servant here, he identified a problem. He said, but what if she doesn't want to come? And, and they dealt with a solution and a decision. And Abraham said, well, if she doesn't want to come, then you're free from everything that you made a pact with me with. Because it's not, you're not the problem, she's the problem. Or they are the problem. So as a servant, we need to address the issue that causes other issues, and we need to be precise in those decisions. Have you, any of you ever tried to kill ants on your property? I have a question. Have you been successful? <laughs> right? So I've heard everything from, oh, you put a little bit of baking soda with sugar. With sugar. Have you heard that one? Yeah, baking soda helps. It makes them like, I guess it's like it, it rots some from the inside out and they die, right? Yeah. Or, or this is the one that I, that I loved when I first came down south. Oh, Brother Jeff, just get some grits. You know how much grits I've wasted? And you know what I found? It takes care of your ant problem there. But it ends up popping up again over there. And, and when you're a servant of God being told to do something by God, God says, the reason, and, and I'm going to use Paul, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Sal, I mean, King Sal. King Sal was told, kill everything. Kill the cattle, kill the children, kill the women, kill the king. Right? 
So instead of doing that, he got some grits. And he killed what he thought. And he thought he got rid of the problem. But he's like, Lord, I, I didn't want to kill the animals because you can use that for sacrifice. Right? We, we, we can use that for the sacrifice. Uh, uh, well, the women were too beautiful, God, and, and, and we're short kind of some pretty women. Everybody here doesn't look kind of right, so we, we got these new women, right, this new flavor. Uh, uh, and, uh, and God, the king, I, I wanted to, to, to humble him and, 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 sh- and, and walk him around and show him what, we're, what we have done. Little do we know that because of his lack of follow-through as a servant, Generations later, hmm? generations are under captivity because of that lineage. You see, because it becomes like the anthill that we thought we killed, and it's just gone for a couple of days or a couple of years, and then it pops back up somewhere else. You see, God did not call us in the in, 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 into the business of of, of being. Um, um, what you want to call it? Um, pest control. We, we're not in the pest control business. No, God is in the eliminate my enemies business. But are you the servant that has the courage of Daniel? That has the courage of David? That has the courage of the apostles? To stand before the enemies, and instead of giving them sugar, you give them the truth. Instead of giving them the watered-down version of what God told you to do, you give them the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because that's what's going to eradicate the descendants of evil that constantly come to visit. This is important. So one, just in case, one, you don't go unless sent. Two, you go when sent. Three, you do nothing else but what you were sent to do. Four, you're prayerful and thankful. Five, you're wise when you win. Six, you speak not of himself but of the master. Seven, you present the issues, and you make a decision. This is the model of being a servant of God. This is the model that God has called us to do. If you read the story, you'll be able to connect the dots that Isaac marries the daughter of who? Or the brother of who? Uh, The sister of who, I mean. I'll give you a hint. Hmm? Daddy? Okay. But if you read it, Rebecca is related to Rachel. Rebecca's brother is Rachel's father. And where does the, where do their kids end up going later? Where does Jacob end up going? There's a reason why he needed to be obedient. God was connecting the lineage of Abraham because of the promise he gave him. He says, I will make your descendants more than the stars and the sand. And the way he was going to do that was through connecting and reuniting the lineage and making children that were going to serve him. You see, sometimes we don't understand what God has called us to do or sending us to do as servants. But I can promise you this, that when God sends you to do something, you are a part of connecting a dot You are part of connecting the dot 
so that you can complete that final picture. You understand what I'm saying? Have you ever played? I, I'm going to tell you, I still love to do it now. When I go to Applebee's and they give you the children's thing and they have the numbers like one through 100, I don't know about you, but I'm an adult. I'm in there. I'm, I'm following the numbers, right? And, and the thing is that as a servant, you are one of those dots. And if one of those dots is not connected, the picture is not complete. And I'm here to tell you to follow this model so that you can connect the dots or the dots in your life so that the picture can be complete for the next generation that will come after us. But you got to go when you're sent. You got to give thanks to God along the way. And as I come to a close, it's interesting because Isaac was about 40 years old when this happened. I know, I know men and women that get worried if they make it into their 30s and don't, they're not married. And here, Isaac was about 40 years old when he got married and roughly almost 60 when he had his first child. Scott just looked at Leslie. Leslie's like, don't get no funny ideas. <laughs> just come up for prayer. We can pray. We can pray. Right, Sister Josenia, we can pray for that. Right? <laughs> Scott is. If you want, Scott, I can lend you mine for a week. I guarantee you, you'll give it back. <laughs> That's too funny. But what I'm trying to tell you here is, is that age doesn't matter when it comes to being a servant and being obedient. Because let me tell you something. The interesting thing is, is that when you go to chapter 25, you're going to see the lineage of Abraham because Abraham gets married again after Sarah. And you'll see the lineage of Ishmael and you'll see the lineage of, of Isaac and you see the birth of, Ish, uh, of, of Esau and Jacob in chapter 25. And it's just interesting because... Isaac's wife, Rebecca, struggled to give or to conceive. And I find that interesting, Sister Carolyn, because oftentimes we question God when we follow his instructions and we don't and there's not a blessing and, and you haven't received a blessing or a confirmation that this is the man or this is the woman or this is the thing or this is the ministry or this is the place where I'm supposed to be. And and, and it was all about timing. Because it says in chapter 25, it says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughters. And I'm not going to go through that. It says, now, Isaac ple pleased with the Lord for his wife because she was, sorry. And Isaac pleaded with the Lord, with, uh, the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So there might be a delay to your confirmation. There might be a delay to your reward. But it's all about timing. Also, sometimes there's a delay because we forget about God once everything is going right. And usually... There has to, there, 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 God has to allow a hiccup in the road for you to remember who your God is. Right? He pleaded. And the Lord granted. Sometimes the place for you is not in people's ears. But on your knees. You see, sometimes we're in people's ears with what God has not done. But Isaac pleaded with God. Anna pleaded with God. And God heard her. 
But look at this. He pleaded with God and got cleansed. What did he just say? Here's a little side note here. It says that when she got pregnant, that she felt that there was a struggle inside of her. And she says, God, and I'm putting it in my own words, if you have blessed me with this, why do I feel a war? Why do I feel a struggle in my belly? And he says, because I have created two nations in you, and one will be stronger than the other. And the younger, I mean, and the, and the older will serve the younger. I.e., and this is what happens, and this is why it's important that you, uh, that you read chapter 25. Out of Jacob comes the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of Ishmael comes the 12 princes, the 12 prince, sorry. So there's 12 prince through the lineage of Ishmael. And there's 12 tribes through the lineage. It's in the scripture. Can I take a minute just to read that part, please? Verse 22. It says, but the children struggled together within her, and he said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of, God, of, of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Hmm. And if you look and you continue, you will see how Ishmael's lineage goes into the lineage of, of Isaac and then the lineage of Jacob and Esau. And you will see how the prince, the 12th prince will come through. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you follow the model of being a servant, God will have your back 100%. When God sends you, there's no doubt. When God is showing you favor and he's showing you grace every step of the way. So I often tell people, You need to understand that when you're truly sent, you may struggle, but God always answers. The problem is, is when you're not sent, when you're struggling, when you're pleading, when you hear no. I want this church to follow this model. And if you follow these seven steps, Start by asking yourself, did God send me? Okay? Yes, God sent me. Am I going to do what God told me to do or am I going to veer off? You see, in God's, in, 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 when God gives you instructions, he doesn't, ex he, he, he's not expecting you to need a recalculation. He's expecting you to be obedient. Right? God's positioning system GPS, God's positioning system doesn't need to reroute you because he already knows which way you're going. The question is, are you going to be obedient? Because he's going to get you there. But I'm going to tell you that a detour is going to waste a lot of time. An 11-day journey became a 40-year journey because Israel kept taking detours. Follow God's instructions when you're a servant. Be a servant because he sent you, not because you feel like it. I heard this the other day, and I want to share it as I close. The pastor said, he says, you can know the scriptures and study the Bible, but without the Holy Spirit, all you have is knowledge. You have no power. And that's very impactful. Because we often confuse knowledge with power. And can I tell you, 
but you need knowledge with power. So don't boast on yourself because of the knowledge you have. Boast on God because of the power he has given you through his Holy Spirit. But then there's the reverse. You have power with no knowledge because you don't know the word. The spirit of God is with you, but he can't pull out of you what you have not invested or put in you. Do you understand what I'm saying? An athlete trains because he's investing time in preparing his body to be strong. Even when his body says, I can't go, he prepares his mind. But if he never prepares, he can't get out of his body what he hasn't invested in it to overcome. That's what I'm telling you today. Let's stand to our feet and pray. doing pretty good. We didn't finish them early these last couple, so don't get used to it now. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you and glorify you for today's word. We ask, Father Lord God, that you give us a spirit, the spirit of being a servant to follow the model of, of Abraham's servant, to be obedient, to be diligent, to be precise, on task, wise, thankful, and not self-seeking, but, Father, speaking of you through every step and every process. I pray, Father, Lord God, for those that are in here. I pray for those that watch through Facebook Live and YouTube. And I pray, Father, for those that you are preparing to be part of this congregation. For, Father, you are worthy to be praised, and you are to be glorified every day of our life. And we thank you and we glorify you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.